before we begin. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, yes, we can see your slides. Wonderful. Okay. So, uh, again, um, very excited to be here. Um, as Manuel mentioned, um, I lead the Fatigue Countermeasures Laboratory at NASA Ames Research Center. And to begin, I'll just tell you a little bit about NASA because um, I, you know, I came from academia. Um, I spent about 15 years um, in the academic world um, before coming to NASA, which is a little bit different environment um, it, where it's where we get to apply the things that we do in the lab in the field. Um, and some of you may wonder why someone from NASA is even giving a talk in a visual um, neuroscience and chronobiology session. Um, but I, I just want to point out that we actually have 10 uh, centers at NASA. So we're a government agency, and most people think about spaceflight when they think of NASA. Um, but we actually have um, several centers dedicated to aviation and astronomy, um, to planetary exploration. And I'm right out here in California um, in the Bay Area near San Francisco. And um, at Ames, uh, we are a research center and we operate very much like an academic laboratory um, doing research to support all of the mission operations um, in aviation and space flight. Uh, this is a picture of our center. We have the world's largest wind tunnel. If you're ever in the Bay Area, um, this is a very notable feature as you drive along the highway. Um, and my lab is right back here, very close to the San Francisco Bay. Um, so it's a, a lovely place to be. Um, and in my lab, uh, we do spaceflight research, and that's what I will talk to you about today. Uh, but we also do a great deal of aeronautics research. Um, and so um, I, I won't have time to talk to you about this um, in this particular talk, but um, this does comprise a large um, proportion of the work that we do. And I find it very interesting in both our spaceflight and aeronautics work um, really inform each other. And then finally, we have a lab. Um, and in the lab, we do more basic studies. And um, I really uh, <laughs> wavered on what to talk about um, when um, Manuel gave me the inf invitation, um, because in fact, we do do work specifically um, in visual neuroscience and chronobiology. Um, but I thought, well, if someone from NASA is speaking, it probably makes more sense to talk about spaceflight because that is what everyone expects. Um, but if you are interested specifically in this area, I would just point you to some of our work looking at eye movement metrics and how they change um, over the course of circadian phase, um, sleep loss, and sleep inertia. So now moving into what I will talk about. Um, so I am going to talk about um, our work on sleep and circadian rhythms in space. Um, and to understand this, um, you just need to know that at NASA, you know, we're focused on sleep and circadian rhythms specifically because we're interested in ensuring that astronauts are able to perform at their best. And we know that they need adequate sleep to do so. And we know that they need to be um, aligned in circadian phase. So I'll first talk to you a little bit about the sleep environment in space um, and the issues that uh, arise associated with sleep environment. Uh, then I'll talk to you a little bit about how sleep in space compares to sleep on Earth um, and walk you through a study that we conducted looking at sleep duration and circadian misalignment on the space station um, and space shuttle. Um, and then I'll talk to you a bit about uh, sleep architecture and some studies that we've done looking at sleep staging and sleep spindles. Um, and then finally, I'll just walk you towards the future. Um, and uh, the future is, you know, the moon and Mars. And we're doing a lot of work right now to prepare for those future missions. So uh, what is it like to sleep in space? Well, I'll just start with this is a picture um, from uh, one of the space shuttle missions. And so what you can see right away is that we have in this particular mission, three crew members who are in sleeping bags. They're all ready for sleep, uh, lined up right next to each other. And you can see that one crew member um, is already prepared for sleep. Um, he has an eye mask and he has strapped his head to the back of um, the wall, which is something that some astronauts prefer. Some like to have that sort of binding um, that they would experience on earth with gravity, while others like to just sort of free float. Um, and so what you can see here um, also with his arms is that he's in what is a very typical space position. And so his arms are floating 
Um, and typically um, in space, the natural position is for one's arms to kind of float up like a zombie. And this can actually cause problems in the sleep environment because um, if an astronaut sleeps with their sleeping bag unzipped, their arms can kind of float around and hit people around them or even themselves during sleep. And so that can cause some sleep disruption that is very, very different from what we experience on Earth. But there are several other causes of sleep disruption um, in space. Um, it's, a, it's a very hostile environment to sleep. Um, and so I've just listed a few things here that we pay very close attention to and that we're working to fix um, that, that you can uh, see illustrate in this slide. So firstly, this is one of the sleep stations that the crew members have available to them on the sleep or on, on the space station. And what you can see in this crew member's sleep station is he has three computers. So much like in our own bedrooms when we have poor sleep hygiene and maybe have screens on right before bed, um, this crew member is um, perhaps not adhering to the best sleep hygiene um, and exposing himself potentially to inappropriate patterns of light exposure with these screens um, in his sleep area. Um, you can also see this crew member is in one of the Russian modules, the Kayuta. And um, the Cayudas are the very early sleep stations that we had. Um, the sleep stations are intended to you know, protect the crew's um, sleep and provide them with uh, sound attenuation and darkness. Um, but in the case of the Cayuta, they were too hot. And so many of the crew members would then keep the door open, which then lets in um, light pollution and noise pollution. And so it really defeats the purpose of you know, having this protected space for sleep. Um, you can see in some cases, crew members don't have sleep stations at all. And of course, there's no direction um, in space. So uh, you can sleep in any, um, any orientation that suits you. Um, and then here, as we go back to the moon, one thing that we're thinking about um, is the impact of um, air quality. And this crew member um, is one of the Apollo astronauts covered in lunar dust. And so uh, we really just don't understand what the impact of uh, that lunar dust is on both physiology, but also, you know, specifically sleep physiology. And so we're watching that um, closely and thinking about it as we go towards the moon. So we have a lot of environmental issues that cause sleep disruption in space, um, but we also have a, a significant issue um, with circadian misalignment. And there are really two specific causes of circadian misalignment. The first is inappropriate um, or insufficient light exposure. And so of course on earth, we all know that um, if we are just following a 24 hour schedule and sleeping at night and being awake during the day, the sun will really do the work of aligning us for us. We don't have to think about it. Um, and in space, that is not the case at all. And so uh, when a vehicle, a space vehicle like the space station or a space shuttle or one of our new commercial um, space vehicles is in orbit, low Earth orbit around the Earth, um, they typically will rotate uh, with a 90 minute period. And so what that means is that there's an approximate 45 minute light dark cycle. And we know that this um, is essentially creating a forced to synchrony type of light pattern um, that humans cannot entrain to. And, and certainly we do not try to have the astronauts sleep when it's dark and stay awake when it's light because we know that would not work very well. Um, but what it means from a sort of practical standpoint is that there's significant potential for the crews to be exposed to light, very bright light from the sun at inappropriate times when they should be um, asleep or preparing for sleep and then not exposed to light when they really need to be. And so we do see some circadian misalignment related to this orbital light dark cycle. And of course, as you might imagine, over the years, um, we have begun to develop countermeasures like good um, window shades that will protect um, the crew members from having that inappropriate pattern of light exposure. But nonetheless, um, it is there and it is um, a significant contributor to uh, circadian misalignment. The other um, issue is schedule induced. And so this is an example from the space shuttle. This is an example from the Apollo missions. And this is an actigraphy plot. I'm sure probably most people are um, familiar with these, but um, the, the bottom line here is each row represents a day. I'll be pre presenting several of these. And in the case of actigraphy, low activity means sleep and then um, black um, is activity, which means wake. And what you can see here during this particular mission is that instead of the sleep episode lining up like it does here in the pre-flight period, um, sleep shifts earlier every day. And this is because 
due to orbital dynamics. Uh, when the space shuttle was going around the Earth, um, there was uh, you know, a weird timing of when the launch and landing had to happen. And so the decision was made to keep the crews on a non 24 hour schedule in order to ensure that they would be awake for those activities. So we have a schedule induced circadian misalignment. And of course we know without appropriate lighting countermeasures that can lead to, um, you know, a, a, a significant um, dissociation between the drive for sleep and wake and um, the timing of social activities. Um, and then similarly for Apollo, you know, if we go all the way back, there was really no consideration for sleep um, or circadian rhythms. They just sort of slotted sleep in where it would fit in the schedule, which we know is a bad idea. And so we haven't done a very good job of scheduling um, astronauts at NASA over the years. We're working on it. So with all of that as a, a you know sort of baseline information, um, the question of course is, are there differences between sleep on Earth and sleep in space? And this is um, Italian astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, who is um, part of the most recent um, International Space Station mission, but this is a um, photograph from her first mission in space, and she is modeling the sleep station in a different view, so you can kind of get a full view of what um, the sleep environment is like in space right now. Um, but uh, just to, you know, jump right into the answer to the question that I posed on that slide, um, we do have a sleep problem in space based on what we know from prior missions. And so what you can see here are just um, the results from uh, the studies where sleep was measured in space. And so we have a couple of diary studies um, from Apollo and then some, uh, you know, a cluster of EEG studies across the years on the space station Mir, Skylab, which was in the 70s, and then some of the um, space shuttle missions from the 80s and 90s. And what you can see here is that, you know, we know people tend to overestimate their sleep. So we suspect that the sleep diary is a little bit um, overestimating what the crew members actually got, whereas um, the EEG studies all sort of cluster around six hours. And we know that that you know, is really not where we want to be. Um, we would prefer the crew to be getting, you know, seven to eight hours of sleep per night for optimal health and well-being. And so, you know, why is this? Um, so several years ago, um, I worked um, at um, Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and worked with Dr. Laura Barger and um, Chuck Seisler on a study to evaluate sleep in space and to understand um, why sleep duration might be different in space compared to on Earth. And so uh, we first aim to compare sleep duration in space to Earth, um, look at the countermeasures that astronauts might be using to help them sleep. Um, we aim to uh, look at short versus long duration missions because, of course, there you know there's some thought that maybe um, there's habituation and over time the crews would get lo longer durations of sleep um, as they spend more time in space um, and maybe have less workload or less pressure um, to um, on them to um, you know sort of encroach on their sleep opportunity. Um, and then we also aim to assess the influence of circadian misalignment on sleep outcomes. So to do this, uh, we conducted a study um, and I just have a little schematic here uh, illustrating the timing of the data collection. So um, L stands for launch here. So at 90 days prior to launch, L minus 90, we collected data for two weeks. Um, and for this study, we collected actigraphy and sleep logs. So um, just basic information about um, the crew members sleep uh, and uh, self-reported medication use. Um, and then we collected data at 11 days prior to launch right up until they um, launched and typically um, they were launching on a space shuttle or a Soyuz vehicle for this study. And then we had two different types of data collection. Um, one was on the space shuttle or the short duration missions. Typically the space shuttle missions would last about two weeks. And then another data collection for long duration missions where they only collected the sleep log every three days. Um, but these are um, missions where crew members would stay on the space station for um, 
you know, months at a time um, to give us some of that long duration information. And we collected all this information until they returned and then collected for seven nights upon their return. And then we also used um, the CPSS circadian performance simulation software to estimate the timing of core body temperature minimum um, in order to try to get a handle on uh, just the amount of circadian misalignment that um, is happening in space and how that might be affecting sleep and medication use. So overall, um, with these studies, we had um, a large amount of participation. This um, it, you know, even stands now as one of the largest studies ever conducted um, during spaceflight. We had 64 crew members for a short duration um, you know, missions, which lasted about two weeks. And then we had 21 crew members who participated in our long duration missions, um, which lasted um, several months. Um, and I do want to note that um, you know, if at NASA, the policy is that the crew members are scheduled for eight and a half hours of sleep per night. So this should not be an issue of them just not having the opportunity for sleep. They should have the opportunity for sleep. So the question is, you know, can they sleep or not? And then again, what are the factors that are influencing them? So what we found was that sleep duration is shorter in space relative to on Earth. And so what you can see here is um, in the light gray, we have the short duration missions. In the dark gray, we have the long duration missions. And um, here is our uh, 90 days prior to launch, 11 days prior to launch, and in-flight and post-flight. And um, in-flight is shorter um, than than. Uh, pre-flight and post-flight. Um, it was not shorter than uh, the immediate 11 days prior to launch, but that's not too surprising because if you're about to get on a rocket and launch into space, you probably are excited and maybe a little stressed and perhaps not getting as much sleep. Um, but overall, um, we confirmed the results of those other studies showing that sleep duration is reduced to about six hours a night. Um, the other notable thing here is you will note that you know sleep duration in that 90 days prior to flight isn't all that long. The crew are getting you know maybe seven, uh, six and a half hours on average, and um, we think that that relates to just their extreme workload leading up to a mission, even in the three months prior. And so um, we have data at this point that shows that in fact astronauts do generally get about the seven to eight hours a night um, that we would expect on Earth when they're not in the middle of a training flow. Um, so we don't believe that this is just a self-selection or just that these, these people just need less sleep overall. So what um, does this mean for hypnotic use and other countermeasures? Well, we find that the crew members um, really um, used a huge amount of hypnotics. Um, and so we think that this you know, relates to them understanding that sleep is important and um, trying to um, use uh, the tools that they had at hand to help improve their sleep. So we found that 78% um, of participants used hypnotics at least once and that they were used on 52% of nights in flight. And this little chart here, I think nicely illustrates very quickly at a glance, um, the sort of uh, spread of hypnotic use. So each row here represents a single person who flew in space. And then each box represents a day in space. And so if you look across, that would represent one person. And if the box is um, gray, it means that that person didn't take any hypnotics. If it's blue, it means that that particular night they took one. And if it's red, it means they took two. And so you can see there are some habitual users of two, two hypnotics um, per night, uh, which was very surprising to us. And it, it does sort of highlight that some people, you know, have much more difficulty sleeping in space and are, are really relying on medications um, to help them sleep. But when we look at the impact of these hypnotics on sleep, we really don't see any um, huge benefit. So there's no difference in sleep duration with hypnot nights with and without hypnotics. Um, but the crew members do fall asleep about 10 minutes faster. And so we think that that actually may be driving the hypnotic use, you know, just that improved sleep latency. Um, but we were surprised that we didn't see longer sleep associated with the hypnotic use. So the next question um, that we wanted to ask uh, with this is, well, what's the role of circadian misalignment here? And um, again, this is modeled um, circadian phase. So what you can see is each row represents a day in space. Again, the gray bars represent sleep here. And the little dots um, represent 
the modeled um, core body temperature minimum. And here we just looked at whether the core body temperature minimum was in or out of the sleep episode and um, determined just very crudely whether um, a person's uh, was aligned based on that criteria or not. And what you can see is the schedules are a little bit crazy. So in this case, we have a crew member who's um, got a fairly regular work schedule, but these are weekends and the crew members have uh, time off on weekends. And this person is sleeping like a teenager and sleeping in until around noontime on those weekend days. Um, and then you see there's a little shift where this is where a, another um, space shuttle comes up to the space station. The whole crew has to shift their schedule and then shift back. And then uh, the crew member becomes a bit misaligned on return to the baseline schedule. Um, over here, you can see just a progressive phase delay. Um, that's um, induced by the schedule, not chosen by the crew member, um, and a big leap here, which leads to significant um, misalignment between the predicted core temperature minimum and sleep opportunity. And so what we found from all of this is that circadian misalignment occurs on about 20% of nights in flight, and it's largely due to these um, schedule imp this in these imposed schedules. So when we look at the consequences of this circadian misalignment, it's quite um, a big deal because when the crews were sleeping in a circadian aligned state, they got about an hour more sleep than when they were in a misaligned state. And when we compare this to hypnotics, you know, this is a big deal. They didn't get any benefit from hypnotics by just aligning their schedules um, with their circadian rhythms. We see a, an increase in their sleep duration in space. So we've really been working since I've come to NASA on trying to make sure that um, schedules are aligned to help improve sleep. And then when we look at hypnotic use related to this circadian misalignment, what we see is that um, in those periods of time when the crew members were predicted to be misaligned, uh, that is their sleep episode was mi misaligned from that predicted core temperature minimum, uh, they used more both more hypnotics, which makes sense, you know, if you're a shift worker and having difficulty sleeping during the day, um, you may be more likely to reach for a countermeasure like a hypnotic to help you sleep. Um, and then we also found that um, surprisingly to us, um, they reported using more medications just in general General when they were misaligned, which really, I think, hits home the impact of just the, the bad feeling that you get from both, um, you know, the uh, imposed uh, misalignment with your sleep-wake cycle, but also just the probably peripheral misalignment that's occurring um, throughout um, other body systems. So, um, we've really taken this to heart at NASA and are working again very hard on trying to keep the crew members aligned. So from this study, we just find that sleep duration is shorter in space, um, that hypnotics aren't particularly effective, um, there's pretty significant circadian misalignment, and that it, that circadian misalignment does seem to be influencing um, sleep uh, outcomes and countermeasure use. So um, with you know that as the, the sort of study that led me to NASA. So I started um, when I was in Boston and then was recruited by NASA and continued the study um, here. Um, I turned my attention more towards sleep architecture um, because uh, of course, you know, we know that short sleep is, is not a good thing, um, but uh, you know, the, the big questions that I have are, you know, does microgravity affect the brain? Is sleep architecture different? And, um, so it's very, very difficult to fly hardware in space. Um, it's, uh, it's expensive. Um, NASA is really um, loath to do anything that's going to be expensive without a really um, firm operational rationale. And so, um, you know, I have not yet succeeded in uh, getting a, an EEG device into space. I'm still working on that. Um, but my solution was to go back and look at archival data and sort of bring other people into the fold to do some reanalysis of um, data that um, was previously collected for other reasons to see if we could help inform some of this. And, you know, looking back at the studies where EEG was collected, we really have we really just don't know if spaceflight affects sleep architecture or if maybe all of the other things that I already described are responsible for the changes that we see um, or have seen in the past in sleep architecture. And so, you know, really, again, as you can see on the slide, it's just a mixed bag. We have um, 
with REM sleep, once there's just one study that really reported REM sleep increases, another found an increase in eye movements. Two studies said slow wave sleep increases, two said slow wave sleep de decreases, and then a couple of studies looked at redistributions of um, uh, sleep staging in cycles. And so again, you know, is this because they're circadian misaligned? Is this because they're sleeping in a noisy, you know, terrible sleep environment, we, we just don't know. Um, and so I think we need to do a lot more work here. Um, but um, this, again, was really the catalyst for me um, trying to figure out how we can, you know, inform this a little bit better. And so I went into the archives um, at NASA to try to fit, find out what data might be available. And um, I had an intern, Oliver Pilch, um, who at the time was at Harvard uh, College as an undergraduate. And um, in looking at the archives at NASA, I found that Bob Stickgold, who was at Harvard Medical School, had collected data with something called a nightcap, which is shown here, um, which is just a device that has little electrodes over the eyes um, to assess uh, just REM or non-REM state. And so I said, Oliver, go talk to Bob <laughs> when you go back to school and see if you can get uh, him to agree to let us reanalyze that data. And Oliver did, and Bob agreed, and Oliver um, ended up doing this analysis for his senior thesis in school. And so um, we're, we're, this is unpublished work. We're, we're in the process of um, preparing the manuscript now. Um, but what you can see that we have here is um, quite a bit of data um, with this nightcap system. So 11 nights, um, very much before launch um, and in two data collection bouts and then three bouts of 11 nights throughout. Um, this was from Mir, um, the space station Mir uh, in the 90s, three bouts there. And then we have some post-flight data as well. And um, one notable um, uh, feature of Mir is they kept a 24 hour schedule and they were pretty good about it. So there's very little um, schedule induced circadian misalignment. And you can see that here in these crew members roster plots, um, really not a lot of variation across the 24 hour schedule. Um, so what did we find? Well, um, I, I think it's quite interesting. Um, so in these plots, we have pre-flight, space flight, and post-flight. And you can see pre-flight and post-flight are pretty much the same in each of these plots. Um, but I think note the two big um, uh, factors that are really notable are that sleep duration um, did not increase over the course of time and space. Um, and also we saw a significant drop in REM at the beginning of time and space um, that recovered almost to um, pre-flight levels by the time uh, the missions ended. Um, so that was, um, a, that was pr a pretty big deal. Um, and then we also saw just overall an increase in wake in the sleep episode um, at the expense of both REM and non-REM sleep. Um, and so again, we're, we're pretty excited about these findings, um, but it, we have a small sample size. So there are limitations to our interpretation here. Um, but overall, um, I think this is just points to the need to do more studies looking at EEG in space because this reduction in REM, for example, may be just a byproduct of chronic sleep restriction, but it, it's, it could also be um, related to just an influence of microgravity in itself. We just don't know at this point. Uh, so we need further, further data exploring that. Um, and then a second um, uh, data analysis that we did um, was looking um, at microarchitecture in space. And so um, for this, uh, it's really a, like a, a long, a very interesting story, um, but I um, met someone at a conference who um, introduced me to Dominic Kohler, um, who at the time was working at the European Space Agency Advanced Concepts Team, um, and Vita Kassanen, uh, he was working with her, um, uh, who was also on the Advanced Concepts Team. And they're both very interested in looking at microarchitecture and reanalyzing um, some of the data that had been collected in space. So like-minded people, we, you know, very excited. Um, and so we, um, we put together this collaboration that lasted far longer than anyone thought it would um, just to um, extract the data from the archive and then do the analysis. Um, but we were able to get data from NeuroLab um, from one of the space shuttle missions in the 90s. Um, and uh, Dominic and Vita um, analyzed the data to look at um, spindles, sleep spindles over the course of the sleep episode, and um, to look at 
um, uh, slow wave sleep. And so uh, with this, um, we collected data um, for this, or the original researchers were Dirk Jan Dyke um, and, and Chuck Seisler, and they collected data at um, two days, at 30 days prior to the mission, um, three days, uh, seven days prior to the mission, and then they had four data collection points in flight and three post-flight. And so that's um, a little less data than some of our other studies. But for this particular study, we had a much better um, EEG system, which is shown here. So this is Senator John Glenn um, on one of those neural lab missions. And you can see he's got um, a full polysonography um, with the EEG cap um, you know, and even respiratory bands um, and an oximeter. And when we did this reanalysis, what we found was that fast spindle density increased um, and slow spindle frequency increased, which um, again, small sample size here, but um, it's pretty exciting to us because we know that spindles are associated with motor skill learning. And this is a relatively short duration mission because it was on the space shuttle. And so um, we suspect that um, this, um, increase in spindle density and frequent fast spindle density and slow spindle frequency may um, actually relate to some of that motor skill learning that the individual that the astronauts have to learn as they get into space um, they're using their legs very little relative to on earth using their arms a lot more um, and so there may be a, a, a bigger story here that we would like to explore in a, a dedicated study in the future um, uh, so overall, um, with this, um, we just would conclude that, um, you know, sleep loss is due to what we call space flight insomnia, um, particularly from the study on MIR, um, you know, uh, the sleep loss seems to be associated with an increase in wake after sleep onset and sleep latency increases, um, not really by, you know, schedule disruption specifically, um, at least for that study. Um, so there's probably a combination of factors and some of them are mission dependent. Um, we saw reduced REM sleep and then we saw reduced, I didn't actually put the slide in, but we saw reduced slow wave sleep um, in the, the reanalysis of the neural lab data um, that Dominic did, and there may be links to the glymphatic system with that. And then, you know, with the um, spindle density, again, we were really interested in understanding how that may relate to just the nature of adapting to space flight and interested in understanding whether that is in fact an effect of living and working in microgravity. So, um, so, <laughs> you know, I think um, with all of that, uh, hopefully you have a good sense of what we currently know about sleep and circadian rhythms in space. Um, I will note that, you know, probably obvious given what I've shared so far, um, we, uh, you know, collect data in a very slow manner. So it takes, you know, years to get equipment into space. When we do, it takes years to collect data because there aren't very many people in space. And so, you know, while I'm very enthusiastic and hope that we can, you know, continue this and learn a lot more and partner with more people, um, there's there's a lot more to do and um, patience is required as we move forward. Um, but I'd like to take you on a little journey to the future to help you understand what we're working on right now as we're moving towards the moon and Mars. So, um, of course, right now, the majority of our work um, and our missions are on the International Space Station. It's been around for more than 20 years, and we have some experiments happening there that should help inform future missions. Um, but we also want to make sure that the crew members on the space station have, um, you know, are able to entrain uh, and are able to get adequate sleep. Uh, we have uh, the Artemis lunar expeditions that are coming up um, in the next um, couple of years. Um, you know, it's very exciting. We, we're launching the sort of first unmanned vehicle, um, you know, right, right now. And um, as that uh, proceeds, you know, we will be sending people back to the moon. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those missions in a second. And then ultimately, um, we're looking towards Mars. And there are a lot of um, aspects of going to Mars that are very different than the other um, mission operations that we currently have, especially from a sleep and circadian rhythms perspective. So with the space station, um, 
we're in a pretty good routine right now. Um, the space station is huge. Um, so there's a lot of room for the crew to move around. Um, this is um, the cupola. I mean, one thing that you can see here is there's a lot of equipment. So while there's a lot of space, you know, it is a crowded space, um, but the crew can look out the windows. They, they can have private space. They can have private sleep stations. Um, we can fine tune those. We can, you know, do a lot because the space station is relatively close to earth. So we can send up new technology, um, uh, not easily, but easier than we will um, be able to do for say a Mars mission. Um, and so this is a nice um, place for us to do research uh, again, to inform some of those future endpoints. And I think that we've really started to get into a groove here. We have a fatigue management service. Um, this is Dr. Smith Johnston, who is now the medical director for Axiom Space. Um, they just had a private crew launch um, uh, uh, that just returned, I think last week. Um, but he worked for NASA for a very long time and really helped to establish this fatigue management service. So before the astronauts go into space, um, they're given customized schedules. And when they do have to do sleep shifting, um, the fatigue management group gives them advice on how to use countermeasures, how to use a blue light, <laughs> which is shown over here, um, to help them adjust and how to help them adjust, say, when they're training in Europe. Um, uh, or Japan or other places around the world. And so we have a pretty good process for just that fatigue risk management at this point um, with our space station crews. Um, we also have um, some really exciting experiments happening. So Dr. Stephen Lockley and Bud Brainerd are um, the co-PIs on a study looking at whether solid state lighting that can change its spectra, a, a spectrum across the day um, is sufficient to entrain the crews and then of course to improve their sleep and alertness and performance. And so that study has been ha going on for several years and we don't have the results yet, but we're very much looking forward to um, understand whether this would be a, a countermeasure that we could use um, into the future. So, you know, while we have a good handle on that, um, everything is going to change when we go to the moon and it's, it's just going to be crazy. We're going to a small vehicle, so there's not going to be a lot of space. Um, we're going to send this Orion rocket to the moon. It will attach to this, um, this uh, space station that's going to orbit the moon that will be called Gateway. It'll be a little tiny space station that just goes around and around the moon. Um, and then from the Gateway, we're going to have this human landing system that's going to go back and forth from the lunar space station to the surface of the moon. And then eventually we hope to have um, a habitat on the moon that could be expanded um, for surface operations. And so there will be no sleep stations. The schedules will probably be crazy again and um, the crews will be, there will be psychosocial issues because the crews will be all compressed together. And so we are doing analog studies um, in order to help inform this. I'm not going to go deep into um, these results just for the interest of time. This is more just to kind of give you a sense of what we're doing, but we have um, this little habitat um, at Johnson Space Center and we um, do fake space missions there. So there's a fake mission control. Crews are selected just like the astronauts are. Um, crews of four people go into this little habitat and they live there um, for, you know, a week, two weeks, a couple of months, and we study how resilient people are, what are the characteristics associated with resilience, we can control a lot more to do experiments. Um, and for our purposes, um, for this most recent study, we were interested in um, how um, resilient crew were, um, and that was in partnership with researchers um, uh, at DLR actually um, in Germany. And then we're also interested in how well biomathematical models might predict um, actual performance. And again, I'm not going to go deep into this for time, um, but this is a recent mission that we conducted um, looking forward to the moon where uh, the crew were in the habitat for 45 days. We collected data from four missions um, I'm sorry, five missions of four crew. Um, they had five hours of sleep per night and eight hours sleep on the weekend. So pretty severe sleep restriction. And then we looked at their performance on the psychomotor vigilance task um, over the course of that mission and found, you know, I think the most exciting thing here, or most interesting thing is um, we did see a small decline in performance over time, but the, the gray, so this is um, mission day on the x-axis, 
um, the gray are the individual um, trajectories. And what you can see is we have um, a big split in resilient performers. Um, so again, remember five hours of sleep per night on the weekdays. And then we have some, some people who are more vulnerable or susceptible to that sleep loss. And so we're really trying to parse out you know, what the reasons for the, the separation might be in order to inform maybe astronaut selection as we go forward to the moon and Mars. And then finally, um, just a couple words about Mars. You know, again, Mars is going to be this um, huge effort, um, you know, almost certainly a multinational effort, um, maybe commercial uh, space. Uh, I will get there first, um, but it's going to be a long journey, nine months to a year, maybe more. Um, and uh, when we get to Mars, um, there's some notable differences. So obviously it's a red planet. Um, the surface of Mars is red, but the spectrum is different um, with sunrise and sunset. Um, there's a very thin atmosphere. There's a lot more red light. It's further from the sun and it rotates um, with a period of 24 hours and 39 minutes. So on the one hand, that's remarkably similar to Earth, especially compared to the rotation of any other planet, but it's also sort of just far enough away that we have concerns that some people may not be able to entrain even with appropriate lighting countermeasures. And so, um, We've done several studies trying to look at how people might adapt to that Mars time. Um, this is a published example from a study that we did in 2012. Um, and this is just an example of some of the opportunistic work that we do at NASA. Um, in this particular study, um, or just in general, I guess what you should know is for our Mars uh, rover missions, uh, this is a picture of Curiosity here, um, but this picture is from uh, the Phoenix Mars lander uh, uh, mission to Mars. Uh, when scientists and engineers go to um, send a rover to Mars, uh, they live and work on Mars time on Earth. And so it gives us a really um, unique opportunity to be able to assess um, you know, maybe new countermeasures or um, the influence of, of living down that Mars time. Of course, there's the artifact of, you know, being on Earth. So you have sort of two um, different uh, stimuli that are um, driving people, um, people's sleep and wake schedule. But um, for this study, we used a blue light countermeasure during their workday and really um, gave, tried to work to give them sleep hygiene education to block out light um, during their sleep periods. And what we found is that out of 20 people, um, 19 were able to adapt to that Mars soul of 24 hours and 39 minutes with the countermeasures that we provided. And so we feel pretty good about um, the ability of most people to adapt to this Mars time. But of course, you know, with 20 people, we have more work to do. Um, we need to understand how intrinsic period may influence one's ability to adapt. So we're continuing this work, um, continuing the opportunistic studies um, in order to make sure that when our crew get to Mars, they can uh, be alert during their wake periods and sleep during their sleep opportunities. So with that, um, you know, sort of gave you a broad overview of the work that we're doing at NASA and the, the future work. Um, you know, I am always working to just get more data. Um, so I would like to assess sleep architecture in a larger sample. You know, these ends of four are all we have right now, um, but we, we, need, we need sleep architecture in a much bigger sample um, so that we can, we can understand more about how spaceflight might affect um, affect sleep and circadian rhythms um, in sort of a clean um, environment with, you know, without all of the schedule disruption. Um, this lymphatic system issue is of great interest. So um, those redu you know, reductions in slow wave sleep, there's, I think the jury's still out about whether or not that's a space light effect, but in space, there's a fluid shift. So um, you don't, you know, have gravity pulling all of your body fluids down. Um, so if you look at astronauts on the space station, they tend to have kind of chubby faces um, because all their fluids are sort of floating up to their, their head. And so there, um, there's intraocular pressure. There may be um, effects on slow wave sleep and the glymphatic um, waste clearance um, that happens during slow wave sleep. So we need to understand that better um, for their long-term health and well-being. Um, and then of course, we need to continue to assess these countermeasures, not just for our current missions, but also going forward to Mars. So this is uh, my team. So it's a lot of people contributing to this um, work. Um, and uh, 
I'll just say thank you. And I'm very, very happy to answer any questions.